You're watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. The Federal Judicial Center presents The Architecture of Antitrust, an FJTN program for judges, staff attorneys, and law clerks. This broadcast is a videotaped and edited version of a lecture presented at the Center's National Workshop for District Judges in Baltimore, Maryland. The lecture was given on August 10, 1999 by John Shepard Wiley, Jr., Professor of Law at UCLA School of Law in Los Angeles, California. This is an area of law that I love dearly and I love to talk about it to an audience that really shapes this area of law. Um, I want to make a number of points today. But I want to start off with the key idea that uh, antitrust, it's a common law field. Um, the Congress has really given you, the federal judiciary, an area of crucial national economic policy to invent. And really that's what federal judges have done during the century that we've had the Sherman Act. Uh, I'll elaborate on that, then go on to make a second basic point that these days antitrust law is all about antitrust economics. Courts have got to understand some basic economics to apply modern antitrust doctrine. And really there's three key economic points that I'd like to make. In the time available, it's impossible to cover all of antitrust. We've had a hundred years of it. I've got 90 minutes to talk. I'm not going to try to uh, uh, divide the number of years by the, divide, the number of minutes and uh, shape the talk accordingly. The uh, points I'm going to make are basic points, are fundamental points, and the first is the simple but crucial point that competitive pricing is fundamentally different from monopoly pricing, and we'll talk about exactly how that is. Uh, the second economic point I want to make is that cartels are the central evil that the Sherman Act tries to forestall or prevent, they aim to mimic monopoly conduct and their aim is the target of the per se rule against price fixing. That's really the core rule of the Sherman Act. It's a simple rule. The Supreme Court has made it a simple rule and it's a powerful rule. I'll try to explain uh, exactly what that rule is about in a straightforward way. Third related to the uh, first two points is something that uh, I'm going to refer to as the market concentration supposition. Now this is an idea that's uh, crucial to a lot of antitrust analysis having to do with the inferences that we draw from market concentration. It's a controversial idea uh, and it's varied over time but the basic point I want to drive home is that the notion is that the more concentrated the market, the fewer the number of players, the more likely is cartel conduct. We'll talk about the application of that third principle. And then finally, all this economic analysis is important, but as always, economics serves some larger policy goal. And it's been up to judges, really, to define what those policy goals are in antitrust, and they've changed over time. They've changed over time in a way that's f fundamentally important to appreciate, because you have, for your use, Supreme Court opinions that have never been overruled, never even been questioned by the Supreme Court, and yet they are literally from a different era. They're from an era uh, when goals were, I think it's fair to say, quite different than antitrust goals are recognized by the Supreme Court to be today. So I want to get a sense, uh, I want to give you a sense of how these underlying policy goals have changed over time. So uh, let's start at the top here. I've got three basic points to make. My first one is that um, we're talking about a common law field. Now, uh, Peter and Mark just gave you an overview, a spectacular overview, of a highly statutory set of subjects, patent, copyright, and trademark. Those are doctrines that are numbingly uh, filled with statutes. The patent code in particular uh, is very long. Uh, copyright, copyright code is as well. Uh, heavily statutory topics. Now, the Sherman Act also is an act of Congress, of course. That's our fundamental antitrust statute. But uh, the first place to start with the Sherman Act is its brevity, its breathtaking brevity. It's very short. In fact, 
there's really only four words that are important in Section 1 of the Sherman Act. Every contract, combination, or conspiracy. Okay, those are agreements. Those are all synonyms. Those aren't helpful. Uh, that's not helpful detail. That's just repetition. So contracts, combinations, conspiracy. In criminal law, uh, you'd say uh, that all collapses into a meeting of the minds, a conspiracy, an agreement. Okay, so agreement in restraint of trade. There's your four words. Agreements in restraint of trade are illegal. In fact, they're a felony. Wow. Now, it was Justice Brandeis who made the fundamental observation that this can't possibly mean what it says. Why is that? Because every contract is in restraint of trade. That's the whole idea of a contract, is to restrain trade. If I take my 1965 Carmen Ghia, one owner, <laughs> and offer to sell it to you next week for $5,000 today, I wish. You give me the 5000 we have a deal. And then I try and go sell the Carmen Ghia to somebody else before I deliver it to you. You can restrain me from trading away the thing that I have contracted to you for because we have a deal. So how can it be that a contract which has the very purpose of restraining trade is a felony if it does indeed restrain trade? Well, those words can't mean what they say, said Justice Brandeis in the Chicago Board of Trade case. And so it's a judicial gloss that comprises all of the law on contracts and restraint of trade. The same thing is true in an even more spectacular way of Section 2 of the Sherman Act. And there's really only two sections of the Sherman Act that make much difference, Sections 1 and 2. So this is it. Section 1 has got those four key words, contract and restraint of trade. Section 2 says every person who shall monopolize shall be deemed guilty of a felony. That's only one key word to monopolize. Now, that word also can't literally mean what it says. I mean, to monopolize means to gain a monopoly, a single firm in possession of an entire market. Well, if <coughs> courts were literally to insist that uh, monopolizing require a firm to get 100% of the market, nearly no firm gets 100% of the market. And so to insist on the literal language here would, instead of making the uh, section apply everywhere, would make the section apply nowhere. So that's the simple point. This is a common law subject because Congress left all the key words undefined, didn't go into any detail in the statute. And as uh, Judge Frank Easterbrook, formerly Professor Easterbrook, who taught antitrust law uh, before he uh, became a member of the Seventh Circuit, put it, when Congress wrote the Sherman Act, it wrote a blank check. It gave to federal judges the responsibility for engineering our national competition policy. Now, you might say, that's a crazy way to run a country. We want judges, people who have no necessary economic training at all, to be the authors of our oldest industrial policy. Well, it's worked out pretty well. Judges, after all, have a good reputation for being very smart, very diligent, and very properly motivated. You have integrity, and nobody doubts it. And over the course of 100 years of common law development, judges have indeed created our national competition policy. But it's been judicial and not legislative in character. OK, so that's my first point. Second point, some economics. Now. Um, I want to illustrate the point that competitive pricing is fundamentally different from monopoly pricing. Now, I want to do this with a commodity with which you're familiar, gasoline. Everybody buys gasoline, at least everybody who doesn't live in New York City. Now, there may be some exceptions, but even there, people have been known to uh, at least keep a casual interest in what the gasoline market is. So let's take a competitive 
price setting mechanism to start out with. How are gasoline prices set if the market is truly competitive? Well, an Econ 1 course teaches that the beauty of a competitive market is that it drives prices down to cost, so that competitive prices are cost-based prices. Now, why is that? Well, because competition forces prices to be at that level. If we have a truly competitive market, if there are a large number of firms producing petroleum, refining it, and, and selling gasoline to motorists, then prices can't be above costs because otherwise competitive pressure will drive the price down. Why is that? Well, if it's truly a competitive market and my price is $2 a gallon and everybody's price uh, on the other corners in town is $1 a gallon, obviously nobody's going to buy from me. Why? Because consumers have an option. That's the beauty of competition. Consumers have the power to say no. Consumers have the power to walk out of the room. They have the power to exit an incredibly powerful power that consumers have when the market is truly competitive. So consumers can walk when they see a deal they don't like and they can go to a better competitive alternative. So prices are forced down to a cost-based level. Now they're not going to go below a cost-based level because the market won't sustain that in the long run. If prices are forced below the cost of production in the long run, firms will go bankrupt and that good won't be produced at a below cost price. So firms will drop out of the market and the price will come up. So the simple insight of the Econ 1 course is that competitive pricing is cost-based pricing. So good so far. Okay? Let's, um, let's just ask, okay, what are competitive prices in, gases, in gasoline right now? Well, if we assume, let's assume that the gas market uh, presently is competitive, uh, I went online here and found out in California as of uh, earlier this month that the uh, price of gas in California is about a dollar and a half for regular. Now that's expensive because California is a weirdo market. We've got our own air pollution requirements and uh, various other things that makes it sort of an island within the national petroleum market. But it's about a dollar and a half a gallon, about a dollar seventy for a premium. And it turns out that those prices have been pretty stable for the last um, period of time, except since uh, around March. Uh, prices for regular were about uh, $1.20 down to $1.10 even. And then there was a price spike uh, around March, March and April. The price went up. It's tailored off a little bit. Uh, but in general, that's been a fairly stable price. Take a look at another measure. This is a national measure. This is uh, Chicago, Houston, and Dallas unleaded prices. Uh, what we see is since 1994, they've been within a pretty narrow range. Okay, so those are gasoline prices uh, as of the present. There's been a recent price spike, but it's tailoring off. Now, if that's a competitive market, what I want to find out from you consumers is what you'd be willing to pay if John Wiley owned all the gas. Now, this depends on your willingness to pay. The very first point to make about monopoly price setting is it's not a cost-based price at all. Costs aren't crucial. Costs may not even be relevant. What's important is how bad do you want it? Because I will price at what the traffic will bear. And you're the ones who will decide what the traffic will bear. Why? Because each consumer decides for her or himself, what's my next best alternative to gasoline? So let's make this real. Think about your life. Think about how important petroleum is to your life. So let's, let's uh, quantify this. Now, you might say, how can we possibly quantify such intangible things? And the point of a market is you do quantify it. You quantify it down to the penny. You have to. Your credit card company forces you to do that. Uh, so gas is a dollar and a half, maybe $1.70 a gallon. How much can I raise this price of gas 
and uh, still have you buy because you're the ones who are going to walk on me. You're going to go to my next best alternative, to your best, next best alternative. You're going to limit my power. But let's see how much power I've got. I'm going to double the price of gas, $3 a gallon. How many people are going to drop out of the market if I double the price of gas? OK, we've got a per one person who's going to drop out. I'm assuming everybody else is still in the market. I just doubled the 100% price increase. No problem. Well, it's a problem. It's a problem. I know it's a problem. I'm sympathetic. I feel your pain. But let's see the three bucks. You know, I've got a good PR department for my monopoly. I don't want to look hard-hearted. I just want to collect a lot of money. So how about doubling it again? Six dollars a gallon. Let's, let's reverse it. How many people are still with me with six dollars a gallon? Please raise your hand high. Don't, don't be bashful. Now, Your Honor, OK, OK, you're, you're good. Got the $6. OK, look at this. Look at this. It's a dollar and a half a gallon now. I've just gone to $6. I've got the majority of the room still with me. Let me double it again to $12 a gallon. How many people are still with me at $12 a gallon? Now, those of you who've got your hand down, ask yourself honestly, if you went home tomorrow and found gas, $12 a gallon, you'd be mad. But would you really get out of your car? Well, Let me. Usage would go down. Okay, your usage would go down. Okay. All right. So now we're, we see there's uh, some marginal issues that come up, some trade-offs. Your usage would go way down. Uh, I'm trying to illustrate a simple point here. And before we get into the, uh, rather in lieu of getting into the marginal trade-offs of using the, the gas less, in fact, over time, buying a car that gets better mileage, and so on and so forth, my point is simple. As a monopolist, I have a very large amount of power. I have the power to double, triple, fourple, who knows how much raise the price of gas. And in fact, if we look at how much power uh, oil producers have used in the past. Take a look at this chart. This is taking gas prices back uh, over time. This is the glorious uh, 1970 period when U.S. Uh, gas prices were at an all-time low. U.S. production was at an all-time high. Uh, right here we had the Arab oil embargo in 73, 74, and here the uh, Iranian revolution. Uh, look what happened to oil prices when OPEC got serious about flexing its cartel muscles. Prices shot up, shot up dramatically. Now that, that is the evil that the Sherman Act is centrally aimed at preventing. Don't have jurisdiction over OPEC. That is a collection of sovereign nations. Sometimes they're at war with each other. Sometimes they have a hard time cooperating on price setting. But where we do have jurisdiction over monopolists, or at least competitors who are trying to mimic monopolists, we don't want them to raise price just because they have the power to do so. Why? Well, first and foremost, because it's a tremendous wealth transfer from consumers to producers. It's very painful. It makes consumers worse off. It does a lot of other bad things. It distorts efficient uh, pricing decisions and, and, and so on. But the main thing is it's a simple idea that we don't want to pay $12 a gallon when the price of gas, when the cost of gas, is only a dollar and a half. So point one, competitive price uh, setting is cost-based. Monopolistic price setting is what the traffic will bear. And that is a huge flexing of economic power, of, of uh, cartel might that we want to avoid. OK, so that's, uh, that's our, our first point, number one. Now, um, the second point is that, um, excuse me, when you say cost-based, does that cost-based allow a reasonable profit? Yes. Uh, the question is, what do I mean, what's included in the cost that I say is the cost basis for competitive price setting? And in particular, does that include a rate of return? Absolutely. A reasonable rate of return to investment, to investors, to management, that's a necessary cost of production. That's a cost of capital. Uh, you need to have a rate of return to attract capital into a market 
and to, and to keep it there. So yes, there's got to be a reasonable rate of return or else the capital flees the market. Is that responsive, Your Honor? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, important point uh, that can get, be a very tricky point if we follow that very far. Well, what do you mean by reasonable? How do we find that out? But the, the core notion is we're not just talking about physical, tangible costs. We're talking about the costs that are the economic costs to operating any business. So in a competitive uh, market, those are compensated. Okay. Now, we know that a single firm can exercise monopoly uh, uh, power where a competitive market has no such power. The consumers have the power in the competitive market. We also know that where there is a competitive market, the producers could have monopoly power if they just cooperate with each other. This is my second point. Competitors can mimic the monopoly result if they can just get along. Competitors could agree with each other, you know, this dollar and a half, this is way too low for gas, don't you think? I mean, just imagine that we're a meeting of the oil producers of Baltimore, the uh, Gas Station Owners Association. Wouldn't it be better for all of us, and fair too, in a sense that we can all identify with, to sell gas at, well, we don't have to go to 12, let's go to 10, nice round number. Won't you agree with me that that would be good? Won't you agree not to sell gas unless it's $10 or above? If we can agree to do that successfully, my second key point is that competitors have just mimicked the monopoly result. We've just replaced competitive price setting with a monopolistic uh, method of setting prices. Even though there's many of us, we can act as a cartel, as OPEC has tried to. Now that produces exactly the same kind of injury to consumers and for that reason the core rule, the central rule of antitrust law is the per se rule against price fixing. Where producers get together and use whatever mechanism it is that they uh, try to replace a competitive uh, price with a monopolistic price, that could be an agreement on minimum price uh, setting, don't go below 12 or 10. A second method would be to divide markets. You take your neighborhood, I'll take mine. We'll turn each neighborhood into a little monopoly. It could be a third method. It could be an output quota. Hold your production down, hold your sales down to some level that our accountants will specify for us. These are all synonyms. They're all equivalent methods. Uh, minimum prices, maximum quotas, market divisions. We can use any of these or all of these to try to mimic the, mar the monopoly result. All of those agreements, all of those price setting agreements are illegal per se under Section 1. Those are all classic uh, agreements, conspiracies, and restraint of trade. Now, not only are these agreements illegal in a civil law sense, under uh, the recent uh, activities of the Department of Justice, increasingly these actions have been prosecuted in criminal court. Uh, let me give you an example of a typical cartel prosecution here. This is a case that arose in San Francisco. Uh, well, it was prosecuted in San Francisco. This is a change of plea. You all have seen these, uh, oh, way more of uh, these change of plea hearings than uh, you care to probably. Uh, this is before uh, Judge Smith, and uh, the plaintiff is the antitrust division. It is a criminal case uh, prosecuting Harman, uh, Harman and Reimer Corporation in the citric acid cartel. This was uh, just last year, actually 1997. And the assistant United States attorney or the uh, lawyer from the Justice Department says, had uh, this case gone to trial, Your Honor, we would approve that uh, you and other conspirators did enter and engage into a conspiracy to suppress and eliminate competition in the citric acid industry. Uh, we would approve the following facts. Skip over to the second page here. Defendants Harmon and Reimer, through several of its employees, conspired with other major citric acid producing firms to fix the price of citric acid and to allocate among the major citric acid producing firms the uh, volumes uh, produced in the U.S. and elsewhere. Uh, this is a detail I like. The broad terms of the conspiracy were agreed to by a high-level 
uh, group of executives known as the Masters. The details were left to the Sherpas. <laughs> so the Masters formulated strategies, the Sherpas made it work, and the whole thing got caught when competitors uh, policed each other, had an uh, elaborate agreement to make sure that the whole thing worked, and the D Department of Justice found out about it and brought felony charges. Now, this kind of a prosecution, a felony charge with a large, uh, actually these days, a whopping criminal fine has become more and more typical. Uh, take a look at the antitrust division's total criminal fines in antitrust cases on a yearly basis. You can see that antitrust prosecutions have become a profit center for the federal government. Uh, it's not yet rivaling forfeiture. Uh, I'm not sure it ever will. But uh, this is a kind of case that may well appear in your courtroom, uh, typically in the, in the form of uh, an arranged plea, since once a, a corporation is caught uh, red-handed, uh, typically other executives, besides the ones directly involved, will uh, conclude, uh, we need to settle this case. We need to settle this as quickly as possible. A hundred million dollars, sure, we'll write that check. So uh, the maximum fines that the antitrust division has been getting for cartel prosecutions, criminal cartel prosecutions, have been accelerating. Okay, so monopoly price setting differs fundamentally from competitive price setting. Second point, when competitors try to mimic monopoly price setting, it's a felony. It can also be prosecuted civilly for treble damages and so forth. Now. Um, before I leave this point, I'd, I'd like to stress uh, its relationship to the third point, the market concentration uh, supposition. This is the notion that the more concentrated the market, the more likely it is that the producers in that market will be able to fix prices with each other. Why is that? The smaller the group, the easier the coordination problem. That's what cartel management is all about. It's achieving and enforcing coordination. Now, a fundamental point to understand uh, from an economic perspective is that um, coordination is difficult. Price fixing is harder than it looks. Uh, I'd like to drive this home with a little game that I play with uh, my antitrust classes, and I've played this before with federal judges. This is a game. Uh, I, uh, you, can't, uh, you can't get hurt. You can only win in this game. I need two volunteers. Can I get two volunteers to help play this game? Uh, I've gotten a, uh, your, uh, Judge Buckwalter. Uh, I've got one. Uh, okay, and Judge Schwartz. Now, I want the rest of uh, the audience to, to keep an eye on these two judges to make sure they do not communicate with each other. So I, 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 I must inform you two judges that you're now under the scrutiny of all of your colleagues. And I'm going to now ask you to make independent decisions in a little pricing game. Now, imagine that you are service station owners in some small town. Uh, I like to pick uh, my favorite small town in California, Copperopolis. It's by the freeway. There's two gas stations. Each one has a 70-foot tall sign. And every morning, your problem is to pick a price. And just to simplify things, we're going to get all the marginal decision making out of here. We're just going to give you a high and a low price to choose from. Now, if you both choose a high price, tacitly, you've cartelized that market. If you both choose a high price, consumers in Copperopolis will face a duopoly that's effectively coordinated its price to a monopoly level, whatever that level is. Let's just say 10 or $12 high. However, you might choose a low price, a low cost base price. Here's the rules that will govern this game. Oh, I, I should mention, um, I'm going to play this game with real money. So I will pay you.
Uh, it's very far, very far. Next gas station, 200 miles. Uh, and so you have a lot of power in Copperopolis. Now, if you both pick high, each station splits the monopoly profit. Each gets $30. Uh, if you each pick low, uh, then you split a competitive profit. And I'll say that's $10, just to pick some arbitrary figures to get the point across. What happens if one picks high and the other picks low? Then the rule is low gets the 60 and high gets zero. Okay? So, is that clear? Now I'm going to ask you each to write down on a piece of paper in front of you um, your decision in this pricing game. Now, observers, make sure there's no conspiratorial conversations. <laughs> no, no, none of this, uh, no embraces, no whispering in the ear. Uh, you make your decision. No emails. And this goes up on the 70 foot sign. That's right. So you're, you're about to crawl up that, uh, climb up that sign put up that notice to the world, and you know that communicating with your competitor is a felony, so you don't want to do that. You have an independent decision to make. Uh, there's a question or comment. Two questions. First of all, is there a range? And second, is there a minimum low wherein if they go below it, they lose, they, they can't make a profit. So it's like, is it twenty, which is their minimum bid before they lose? Yes. Or any In the real world, we have a lot of uh, complexities. I want to abstract from those and just have a high and a low. So there's no range. There, it's a binary choice. It's an either or choice. So you either got to pick high or low. Have you written down which you're going to pick? I want, I'm going to ask you now, high or low? And just high or low. Just high or low. Okay. D don't look. Don't look. I didn't look. I heard what he said, but I didn't look. Okay. Judge Schwartz. Okay, Judge Schwartz. High or low? Judge Buckwald. High. Hi. Okay. <coughs> so, one, uh, one went high. Judge Buckwalder gets zero. Judge Schwartz gets sixty dollars. Let's play again. Please make that decision another time. Don't look. Introspect. Think about after the sunset and the sunrise. It is tomorrow. It's next day. What's your decision today? Have you reached a decision? Don't tell me yet. Have you reached a decision? Yes. Judge Buckwalder? Aye. Judge Schwartz? No. <laughs> uh, no, no discussion now. No discussion. <laughs> OK. Sun sets, sun rises. Let's play again. Please write, make your choice. Don't communicate. Tell me when you have decided and you're ready to go. Ready? Low. Judge Schwartz? Low. OK, two lows, each gets 10. <laughs> sun sets, sun rises. Let's play again. Make your decision, high or low. Tell me when you've decided. You've decided? Yes. Judge Buckwalder? Yes. Judge Buckwalder? Low. Judge Schwartz? Low. Low. Let's play again. Make a decision, high or low. Tell me when you're ready. Can't conspire. Can't conspire. <laughs> Judge Buckwalder? Judge Buckwalder, your decision? Yeah, high. Judge Schwartz? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We have five rounds of our game. Now let's take a look at what happened here. This is a very interesting uh, result we've got.
Now, we've tried in a crude way to mimic the problem that every cartel faces. Do you cheat or do you cooperate? There's always a cheating incentive because you know if you go low, you can get a bigger share of the business. Now, look what happened to every round. Low, high, low, high, low, 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 high. In every single round, this cartel failed to produce a high cartel price. Because of the cheating incentive, consumers in Copperopolis got a competitive price alternative in every single day that the game operated. Now, this is an artificial game. It, it abstracts from reality in, in many ways. On the other hand, it also represents reality in some crucial ways, too. What we've seen is that even though it's in both players' mutual self-interest to cooperate, they can't do it, or they, they fail to do it. Why? Because there's always a payoff to uncooperative behavior. Now, this is the same result that um, has occurred actually every time I've played this game. Uh, when I played this game in uh, San Francisco, the FJC there, uh, look at the result we got. We got low high, low high, low high. It took three rounds for the high player to get the message. And then low, low. Now this was interesting. On the last, uh, on the last round, uh, this player went high as Judge Buckwalter went high. Now, why did you go high on the last round? Because I, I, uh, I know where Murray's from. <laughs> I happen to have Judge Sports. Uh -huh. And I thought for sure he dropped a high by the uh, fifth time around, so that's why I went high. <laughs> why did even, you go even high? in the example, he's, he's, lives, he's close by, so we suppose we know each other. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, I went high because I wanted to make some more money. Okay. And I thought he'd be going out, too. Now, why did you go high the second round? Uh, basically, uh, the, the, I, I wanted to give it a shot. I thought I'd do another try at high. Okay. And then I decided the third round I had to cut my losses. So. Okay. Is it, was it, would it be fair to call your, your high price uh, an offer uh, to him, an invitation? Absolutely. Okay. We see how, we see how by just using pricing signals and, and no other form of com communication, competitors who know each other in a small market can send messages just by pricing. Now, we see airlines do this. And in fact, the Department of Justice is uh, engaged in some litigation about this right now. Uh, so we, firms can try to collude just via their pricing signals. But there's some problems, because the other firm may decide, OK, fine, you go high. I'll get all the business. I'll go low. So uh, we got the same sort of results uh, in, in San Francisco. Uh, uh, just take a look at some, these are uh, class results. That I, I, I've done this with students. I must say I pay them somewhat less, but I get the same result. These results are highly suggestive to me. Again, uh, you know, I don't want to make too much of them. We haven't proved that cooperation never works. A match with two highs. I, so far, playing in these uh, little mm -hmm. classroom settings, no, never have. So somebody doesn't get the word. Somebody doesn't get the word. Or else, is to, put it, to put it in the uh, student's term, uh, they, they get outsmarted. Uh, they think they've got the right strategy, and the other per person moves one step ahead. Uh, the basic point I want to make here is that although cooperation, although cartelization is in the producer's own best interest, it's harder than it looks. It's tough, it turns out, successfully to pull off a cartel. And that is why that OPEC price spike was just that, was just a spike and not a high plateau. It turned out that moment of effective petroleum cartelization was a fleeting moment. It didn't help that Iran and Iraq were at war in a very, very bloody war, and that in between the battles where they're trying their best to kill the other side, their oil ministers would meet in Geneva and say, okay, well, hostilities aside, now don't you think a $60 price is the right one for a barrel of oil? So there's many real world barriers to the cooperation problem in real life, but what I want you to understand in a, in a visceral sense is just because it's a good thing to cooperate from the producer's point of view doesn't mean it's going to happen. The cheating perspective is an overwhelmingly practical problem 
that faces everybody who would cartelize the market. 